Hello everyone, welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today we're doing the Q&A video for idea number 22, which was cosmology. And miraculously, somehow this week, nothing went terribly wrong. Uh, the previous week, I had broken the blog. I didn't break the blog, actually. WordPress keeps updating itself, so it made it impossible to leave comments. Uh, those have all been restored. The blog is working now. We got good comments. I think, you know, the microphones and lighting and everything are good. In case you don't know, I wrote a blog post um, on how I make these videos. So if you're regular watchers, viewers, um, you remember that in the Q&A video, I think number three, which is on force, energy, and action, at the end, I did a little video tutorial about how I was, I was making these videos. But uh, number one, I've gotten better at it and my techniques and, and programs have changed a little bit. And number two, it, it's actually ironically easier to learn what I do from a text blog post than from a video, because I can say, you know, I'm using ScreenFlow and you can click and then go to what that is. So check out the blog, preposterousuniverse.com slash blog if you want to know more about the behind the scenes picture of what's going on here. We make the biggest ideas videos. Otherwise, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We got good questions, so let's get to them. Um, one question, which is not a question, it was a, uh, uh, an erratum. I made a boo-boo when I was talking about Henrietta Leavitt, who showed the period-luminosity relation uh, for Cepheid variable stars. I went on and on about parallax, but it, Levitt was not directly using parallax after all. I, I just sort of jumbled that in the, my memories of a history of astronomy. Um, what in fact she just did was look at Cepheid variables that are in either the large or small Magellanic clouds. These are small satellite galaxies, which people more or less had an idea that that was true. And she sort of uh, assumed for good reasons and correctly that if you have a bunch of Cepheid variables that are in one little sub-galaxy, then for all intents and purposes, you can treat them as the same distance away. So even if you don't know how far away they are, you know that they're basically the same size, so there's a relationship between their apparent luminosity and their actual uh, distance. So that was, sorry, thank you for the, I forget who said it, but thank you for the correction there. Um, in terms of actual questions, you know, let me, I think, a lot of them are pretty, I was happy to see, a lot of them are pretty straightforward expansion of the universe kind of questions. How we talk about the expansion of the universe, how we derive it, uh, the predictions for it. And so it's good because we live in our everyday lives in, a, in you know, rooms and uh, spaces that are not expanding. So understanding what it means to say the universe is expanding can be a little bit tricky. So one question is uh, the Big Bang which actually, let me let me just talk about the Big Bang because I didn't uh, say as much as I could have about it. It was a pretty long video that we did. So we have this thing where over time you have the scale factor. Remember the scale factor is a function of time, tells you the relative distances between things. And putting aside speculative ideas like inflation and so forth, the basic curve looks like this, okay? I'm not gonna set t equals zero at the beginning because who knows when the beginning was, but it's expanding. And in the future we start accelerating so it looks like that but okay we're accelerating now we've recently started to accelerate so the point is there was a moment when a equals zero when the scale factor was zero okay and this is a prediction of classical general relativity right einstein in 1915-16 uh came up with his theory of gravity you can check out previous biggest ideas videos uh to see what i'm talking about general theory of relativity and as we said you plug in this idea of a homogeneous and isotropic universe a smooth universe that is uniform on large scales into the equations of general relativity you get some predictions and if the universe is made of ordinary stuff, right? Matter and radiation. Okay, so like I said we're forgetting about inflation and stuff like that. Then there's a very strong prediction that at some point in the past, the scale factor was zero, A equals zero. That's the Big Bang, and it's a singularity, much like the singularity at the center of black holes, okay? Shouldn't say the center. Remember we talked about in the, in the gravity video, uh, the singularity inside black holes is in the future once you're there. The Big Bang singularity is in the past. So it is very similar, but also different. And that, that, that one fact is a very crucial difference. If people ever ask you, you know, could the universe be a black hole? It's like the opposite of a black hole. It's like a white hole. There's a singularity in our past with the Big Bang, not in our future, okay? 
And um, Stephen Hawking, actually, his first major contribution to science was showing that it doesn't matter that we made all of these approximations about the universe being perfectly smooth. There is still going to be a singularity in the past in classical general relativity if the universe is made of ordinary stuff. And what he did, actually, it was Roger Penrose who did, you know, the foundational work doing uh, what are now called singularity theorems for black holes, showing that if you crunch into the black hole, you will hit a singularity in the future. Hawking basically ran the clock backwards and showed that the same thing is true for cosmology. And the singularity is a place where the Riemann curvature tensor, or other ways of measuring the curvature of the universe, blow up, become infinitely big. The curvature of space-time itself is infinite, okay? So what do we make of that? What we make of that is, as people have long said, general relativity is not correct. <laughs> it is not correct at the Big Bang. The ba basically, the prediction of general relativity is that general relativity itself breaks down. And this is incredibly non-surprising from the point of view of anyone who cares about the real world rather than the particular theory. If you care about general relativity, then you're a little bit upset by this. But if you care about the real world, you know that general relativity is not the final answer. We have quantum mechanics, and general relativity is a classical theory. So when general relativity is breaking down near a singularity, what it's telling you is the approximation that we can treat everything classically and just do classical general relativity is no longer a good approximation. So we should do quantum gravity or something like that. We don't have the right theory of quantum gravity to plug in, so we don't know what to do. So when people say, you know, many of my fellow cosmologists like to say things like, the Big Bang is, you know, a moment before which there are no other moments. Uh, it is the beginning of the universe. It didn't pop into existence from any pre-existing nothingness. It is just the first moment. Asking what is before the Big Bang is like asking what is north of the North Pole, okay? All of that might be true, <laughs> but we don't know. It might be false also because we don't have a theory that number one, we trust, and number two, is applicable to that moment. All we can say for confidence is that unless there's some exotic form of matter that gets you out of this, like some repulsive matter that is important in the early universe, all we can say for confidence is that general relativity doesn't say what happens. General relativity predicts a singularity, but general relativity is wrong, so don't trust that, okay? So maybe the Big Bang is the beginning, maybe it's not. That's one thing I wanted to say about the Big Bang. But the other thing is, okay, let's take that under consideration when we care about, you know, what the real world is doing. But still, let's figure out what general relativity is saying in these circumstances so that we have a picture in our minds of what some of the possible things are that could be going on. So remember we said that for space, it could be positively curved, negatively curved, or flat. So space could be positively curved like a sphere, uh, flat like a tabletop, or negatively curved like a saddle or a Pringle, plus curvature, zero curvature, negative curvature. And if it's flat or negatively curved, space could go on forever. In any one of these three cases, space could be finite and compact. In the positively curved case, space has to be compact. One good question that was asked was, how do we know that space has to be compact if it's positively curved? So, parenthetically, you know, I'm trying to fill in all the details here that we glossed over last time. It's very hard, or if not impossible, to know something like that, because what we know is that the size of the universe, and we know, even this we don't know 100%, but to pretty good confidence, we know that the physical size of the universe is larger than the size of the observable universe, okay? So when we say the universe is compact under this theory, we're really extending the theory that we have beyond what we observed, so it might not be true. But if space is truly uniform and spherically uh, positively curved, then we know it is indeed compact. And that's not just because uh, we draw this picture or we embed a, a sphere in three-dimensional space in our minds and look at it and say it's compact. Uh, there are theorems in mathematics which say if you have a spatial geometry that has a certain curvature and that curvature is uniform, what are the possible topologies that that space can have? And so when I say if it's 
flat or negatively curved, it can go on forever, or it could be compact, whereas if it's positively curved, it needs to be compact. That is a theorem of uh, differential topology. And uh, we can actually sort of get an intuitive feeling for why that's true, because remember, you're not supposed to think about any of these as embedded in a bigger space. You're supposed to think about living in them. And when we say positively curved, flat, or negatively curved, think about two light rays that initially start off parallel and ask what happens to them. In a flat geometry, they stay parallel forever. Negatively curved, they go away. Positively curved, they come together, okay? So the point is, if you send out a bunch of test particles that are moving parallel to each other or even a little bit away from each other, in a positively curved geometry, if you just, if you don't let it expand, if you just like keep it fixed in size, they will eventually come back, right? They will eventually hit each other. That's not a proof, but that is uh, an intuitive demonstration of how we do think about the fact that positively curved uh, manifolds have to close in on each other and be compact. Okay, what I wanted to do was, um, that was a footnote, what I wanted to do was talk about a couple of things. The difference between, what I really want to talk about is, can the universe be infinitely big at the Big Bang? Okay, so let, let, let's just talk about that. I can, we can come back to where I wanted to go. Um, so look, this is saying, if you, if you just take at face value everything that is literally on this uh, tablet right now, okay? Uh, on the one hand, space can be infinite if it's flat or negatively curved. On the other hand, the scale factor will hit zero at the Big Bang. So people will say that the universe was small near the Big Bang. But here you're telling me that space is infinitely big and space being infinitely big doesn't change as a qualitative fact, even if the scale factor is smaller, right? If space is infinitely big and you shrink it by half, it's still infinitely big. So one thing to emphasize is that, you know, you have to keep in mind what when people are talking about the observable part of the universe and when they're talking about the whole universe extended beyond what we can observe. So when people say, you know, resolutely and with confidence that the universe was smaller near the Big Bang, that's okay. They're not lying, but what they mean is our observable part of the universe, okay? So remember, we talked about co-moving volumes. If you take all the matter and radiation in the universe today and just follow its evolution into the past, it forms a volume, and you can ask how big that was in the past. And the answer was it was very small, like smaller than a centimeter, right? Our whole observable universe today. So outside our universe, was the universe small near the Big Bang, outside our observable universe? Uh, no, not necessarily. And then that's, that's the important point. So the, in the Big Bang theory, right, in the Big Bang theory, not the TV show, but the cosmological model, um, what you can have if, if curvature equals zero, so a spatially flat cosmology, what you're saying is that space-time looks like this. Here's time, here's space, and there is an earliest moment, okay? There's an earliest moment of time, t equals zero. By the way, let me emphasize, let me go back to this discussion of uh, the universe popping into existence, because <clears throat> I was trying to say we don't know whether the Big Bang was the earliest moment of time, but it could have been, right? That's a, that's a possible thing. So the other thing I wanted to say was, there's a vocabulary problem when the universe has an earliest moment in time because, of course, none of us are familiar with that as a feature of the physical world. We all came into existence when time already existed and will go out when time is still existing. So we, not, we don't have the vocabulary to talk in ordinary plain spoken language about the Big Bang. We are tempted to say that the Big Bang came from nothing right? But that's misleading. That's wrong. I, I would go so far as to say it's just wrong because it makes it sound like there's something called nothing that transformed into the Big Bang, <laughs> okay? But that's not the idea. The idea, which again may or may not be true, but the idea is that existence itself has a boundary at the Big Bang. So that's why a careful cosmologist will say the Big Bang represents the earliest moment of time, the, the moment of time before which there were no other moments. And remember, it's a moment of time. It's not a point in space. Everything is uniform. There's no location at which the Big Bang happened. It's a moment. Um, and it didn't come from anything. There wasn't anything before the Big Bang. There was not space or time or existence or anything like that. It's just saying that the universe has a boundary in time. It has an earliest moment. 
So the coming from nothing vocabulary is uh, seductive and people use it, uh, but it's not what is being described, at least according to classical general relativity. Now in quantum gravity, maybe things are different. It's very plausible that there is a meaningfulness you could attach to that phrase, but we don't know what it is exactly, right? Because we don't understand quantum gravity well. All right, there you go. Um, here we're doing classical general relativity and saying, look, space can, I don't know how to draw this. How do you draw an infinitely big space? The point is that there is space at some early time, it expands, and what we mean by expanding is the scale factor gets bigger. But the scale factor is just the relative size of the universe at any one moment of time. So if the universe is infinite, infinite in all directions, as Freeman Dyson said, then it always was in the Big Bang model, okay? It's not true. This is a very long-winded way of getting to this point. If, according, if we live in an open universe, a universe that is spatially infinite in extent, then according to the Big Bang model, there was never a moment of time in which the universe was small. Things were closer together. Things were the scale factor was small. The scale factor went all the way to zero. The density goes to infinity. The curvature goes to infinity. But the universe was always infinitely big. And this is why, to bring it back home, it sort of is not smart to use a vocabulary of, in the Big Bang Theory, the universe came into existence. Because you need to posit an infinitely big universe coming into existence, okay? Now, if you're really technical, you could say, wait a minute, um, I shouldn't even be defining the size of the universe at the Big Bang because it's curved and the curvature is infinite and therefore the metric tensor, which we talked about long ago, uh, doesn't make sense. That's perfectly valid. If you want to say that at the Big Bang itself, I shouldn't be talking about sizes or anything like that, that's fine. I will totally let you get away with that. But if you give me any instant of time after the Big Bang, Planck time, you know, one quadrillionth of a Planck time, whatever it is, in classical general relativity, the universe is infinitely big right away. And if you don't like that, well, then you just don't like general relativity, right? Okay, it's probably if you don't like it because you're thinking that the universe should pop into existence somehow, but that's not what it is. The universe has a beginning. It has a first moment. That's what's going on. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, um, good. Then there's a sort of slightly related thing. Uh, when we talk about inflation, I drew a picture that looked kind of like this. So there was the um, expansion of the universe. There's T, there's the scale factor. And then I said, you know, here is the traditional thing. It goes like this, big bang. And then in inflation, it would go like this, quasi exponential expansion. So someone says, wait a minute. <laughs> It looks, from this picture, like during inflation, the yellow thing, the universe was expanding more slowly than it was without inflation, right? Like the slope here is less than the slope there. But I thought that during inflation, the universe expanded super, super fast. So how, how is this compatible? That's a very good question. And there's a, there's a few things going on here that are worth uh, emphasizing. So remember the Friedman equation. The Friedman equation is uh, Alexander Friedman's invention, Soviet physicist, who said you can take this idea of an expanding universe, plug it into Einstein's equations, get an equation for it. It says that h squared equals 8 pi g over 3 rho. And I'm going to add a piece to this I didn't tell you about last time, because last time I talked about just if the universe is flat. Let's add a little piece just so you know what it is. Uh, oops, and it's, i got to get it right, otherwise I'm going to lose my cosmologist license. k over a squared, where k equals curvature of space. So k is a number plus positive, negative, or zero, depending on whether space is flat, zero, or uh, is positively curved, flat, or negatively curved. So k equals zero, the universe is flat, that's why we could ignore it. That's perfectly valid. In fact, let's ignore it for a little bit. Um, and then remember what h is h is 1 over a dA dt, okay? So for one thing, h is not the derivative of a. h is the derivative of a divided by a, okay? So even though in this little picture here, it looks like the, the slope is very small for dA dt at early times, uh, the value of a is also small. 
So during inflation, let me make it in yellow here, uh, H is approximately constant. That's the idea of exponential expansion, right? Uh, A goes as E to the HT, where H is approximately constant. So um, even though DA DT, even though the slope is small as you go to negative values of T or whatever, uh, the Hubble constant is not any less. In fact, let's look at this equation. Let's set k equals zero, okay? Um, so this is, in other words, a, o, a dot, which is dA dt, over a. A dot is defined to be dA dt, the slope of a. So you have to remember that it's that ratio that gives you h. So when k equals zero, let's make our lives easy, then h squared equals eight pi g over three rho. And rho is the energy density, the you know, we're taking to be uniform everywhere through space. And this is a number greater than zero, like strictly greater than zero. It's never equal to zero without curvature, okay? Um, curvature or the cosmological constant are the two things that can make h be zero on the right-hand side of the Friedman equation. But without that, if you're just in a flat universe, this is what you get, okay? So h squared is never... Um, zero if k equals zero and and also lambda equals zero that that's the cosmological constant because the reason for that is ordinary energy densities rho right what is the number of ergs per cubic centimeter in photons or protons and neutrons or in dark matter or whatever real energy densities are never less than zero okay but the cosmological constant the vacuum energy can be either positive or negative so the two ways to get a negative number on the right hand side of the friedman equation are either to have a cosmological constant be negative or to have positive spatial curvature if k is greater than zero since it comes in with a minus sign you can get a negative uh, term on the right hand side so h is never zero in these in this simple case which means that the universe has to be expanding and I mean, this is obvious, so I won't even write it down, but h is always bigger when rho is bigger, right? So in the past, um, when rho, the energy density in space, the density of stuff was bigger, h was always bigger. In fact, if you look really closely, you can convince yourself, h monotonically decreases. So if we plot uh, the Hubble constant versus time or versus the scale factor, clean that up a bit, um, it never goes up in this kind of cosmology. It can only go down. It depend, the details of how it goes down depend on what's going on. And in inflation, this is still true. We have ordinary matter and radiation. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what's going on in inflation. I'm going to draw this <laughs> pictures that look exactly the same but mean completely different things over and over again. So this was the Hubble constant versus time. Let me plot um, the thing that drives inflation is some scalar field. Again, we don't know if inflation is true, but we invent a field called the inflaton, which serves as the source of energy density in the early universe. We call it phi, cleverly enough. Actually, the vertical axis here is V of phi, and this is phi. So we have some potential for phi, okay? So phi is a scalar field. It has some potential energy. The energy density in phi is one half times phi dot squared, the time derivative of phi. I'll be I'll be nice to you if you're not familiar with this notation and write it out. D phi dt. I love how now you are familiar with that notation because you learned calculus in uh, the second biggest ideas video. Plus v of phi. So there's an energy density that the field has because it's rolling, right? It's moving down the potential. And there's an energy density that it gets just from having a potential, right? There's some value of the potential energy. And so rho for the inflaton is the sum of two terms, but they're both positive, right? V of phi is a, the potential energy is positive and one half d phi dt squared is manifestly bigger than or equal to zero. So the energy density during inflation is uh, greater than zero. And in fact, you can do a little bit more work to show that the energy density only ever decreases. So even during inflation, uh, 
the Hubble constant only ever decreases. So inflation is not something where you start with a non-expanding universe and you start it going, right? That you could invent a cosmology like that, and people have, but that's not the usual inflationary story. The usual inflationary story is that the universe, for some reason, starts like this. In other words, it starts with an energy density, a uh, super duper high energy density in this scalar field, which slowly decreases. And if you want to ask, why did the universe start that way with that energy density? Well, good. You should be asking that question. Nobody knows is the answer. Maybe Stephen Hawking knew or thought he knew. Um, but then the energy density goes down. And what why inflation works is uh, you can say, well, if d phi dt, if the rate at which the scalar field is rolling down the hill is small, then phi, the scalar field itself, is approximately constant. d phi dt squared is approximately zero. v of phi is therefore approximately constant because it's just a function of phi and phi isn't changing. Therefore, uh, rho is approximately constant because, I don't know what happened there, because rho is the sum of zero, this one is zero, and this one is a constant, and then you get a constant energy density, therefore h is approximately constant because h is proportional to rho. Here it is, right there. Uh, you might say, well, what if there is curvature or something like that? But this curvature term, k over a squared, if you start with some constant energy density in rho and also k over a squared, well, as a increases, k over a squared goes down. So even if you had some k over a squared, whether k was positive or negative doesn't matter, k over a squared is going to diminish away compared to the constant rho if you have a rho which is approximately constant, and in inflation, you do. Okay, so even though the point of all this, I have these very long-winded ways of saying very simple things. The point of all this is, um, in inflation, inflation does not ignite the expansion of the universe from zero to expanding to beat the band. Inflation imagines that the universe always had a high energy density, or at least at, at some beginning point, which is ill-defined, had a high energy density, and the energy density always ever decreases during inflation. I didn't prove this to you, but if you go through the equations of motion for the inflaton field, um, this combination of energy, uh, d phi dt squared plus v of phi, never increases in an expanding universe. In a contracting universe, it could increase. But as the universe is expanding, the energy density of the inflaton always goes down. Therefore, h always goes down, even during inflation. And therefore, uh, you know, the, the last thing to say is, if you plug in rho equals constant, h equals constant, h equals a dot over a, we actually inferred this uh, last time, or we mentioned it, if h is approximately constant, then a is proportional to e to the ht. And you get this exponential expansion, okay. So just trying to clear up some misconceptions here. Inflation is not the beginning of the expansion of the universe. Uh, and we don't really know what happened at the beginning of inflation or what put the inflaton up there on its potential. Um, should I, yeah, so that I have more to say about that. Should I say it now is the question. Why don't I say it now? Um, why do we talk about inflation at all? Wow, I'm getting very far away from my outline, but that's okay. We're all friends by now. We're, we've spent hours of our lives together. Uh, you'll put up with me. So the thing about inflation is it was invented to, to explain two puzzles that, uh, well, three puzzles, in fact, that Alan Guth identified. All of them had been identified by other people before, but Guth uh, actually proposed a solution to them for the first time. So he he popularized them. The history of inflation is very interesting. There were other people who had similar ideas other than Guth, but they didn't quite pinpoint the usefulness of them or the mechanism to make them happen in a convincing way. So his paper was really the one that got everyone paying attention to the idea. And the puzzles that were being solved hadn't really been bothering people that much. <laughs> it was one of those things where eh, you could see what these puzzles are and you go on your way because they were not you know, in some sense, they were not like direct conflicts between theory and experiment or theory and observation, right? They were sort of fine-tuning naturalness 
problems. And these days, decades later, uh, that's all we have, so we take those very, very seriously. But, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, Guth published his paper in 80, 81, I think, um, there we had like real experimental puzzles to deal with. So these fine tuning puzzles were not as, as, uh, taken seriously until he proposed the answer to them, in which case it was so beautiful and elegant that people suddenly said, oh yes, these are very, very serious problems. Anyway, the puzzles of conventional inflationary cosmology, um, one was the monopole problem. The monopole problem was a very straightforward thing. We talked earlier about um, topological defects. Remember we had a whole video on topology and geometry? I say this knowing that not all of you watch the video because I see the viewership statistics, but you should watch that one. And what you find is that uh, depending on how gauge theories get broken, we also talked about this in the gauge theory video, so we talked about things in the topology video which we then put to use in the gauge theory video where we said, look, there can be symmetry breaking and the symmetry breaking can lead to topological defects. In ordinary physics as we know it, electric charges come in either pluses or minuses. So uh, there's, there's two different electric charges that are completely independent of each other. But in magnetism, every magnet has both a North Pole and a South Pole. So every magnet in the real world that we know about in the world of experiment is bipolar in some sense. Dipolar? Yeah, dipolar, I guess, would be the technical term. Bipolar means something else. But then you can hypothesize, could there be a magnetic monopole? Could there be just a north pole? If you take an ordinary magnet, which is a north pole and a south pole, so ordinarily, here's a magnet, north pole, south pole, and you break it in two, so you do that, well, then this becomes a south pole and that becomes a north pole. And so you don't actually get... Let me do that prettier, sorry. A little quick there. Um, if you break it into two pieces, the North Pole and the South Pole stay where they were, but this end becomes a South Pole of its own, this end becomes a North Pole, and there's sort of magnetic field lines stretching between them. So you never get, in ordinary everyday physics, um, a magnetic field, a magnetic monopole, which is just North or just South. So nevertheless, there are theories, like grand unified theories, that predict that there should be magnetic monopoles uh, because of the symmetry breaking pattern and the topology of the gauge fields. And a bunch of people, including my Caltech colleague John Preskill in his youth, uh, noticed that not only, you know, we talked about in the cosmology video, on the one this is Q&A for, we talked about relics that are created out of thermal equilibrium, okay, like um, axion particles or something like that, all very hypothetical. Well, magnetic monopoles could be produced in the early universe, and some of them would still survive to today. And you might say, okay, well, that's probably true, but they're probably rare and hard to find. No. <laughs> in fact, what you prove very pretty quickly is that uh, the universe should be almost all monopoles in ordinary grand unified theories. The energy density of monopoles should be orders of magnitude higher than the energy density we observe in the universe today. So there has to be something going wrong with that. Now, there's an obvious solution to this problem, namely grand unified theories are not correct. And grand unified theories, remember, made the prediction that protons should decay, they should not live forever, and people looked for proton decay and didn't find it. So very plausibly, that's the actual correct solution to this problem. So this is not a problem with cosmology. This the monopole problem is a, is a problem that is at the uh, intersection of cosmology and a particular set of ideas for fundamental particle physics, namely grand unified theories. That's what Alan Guth was working on as a postdoc at Stanford um, when he was thinking about this. He was thinking about gauge theories and magnetic monopoles, and he was a latecomer to cosmology. So this is actually what motivated him. And then he went to a talk, um, I think it was by Peebles, but uh, or maybe by Bob Dickey. Yeah, by Bob Dickey. So Bob Dickey and Jim Peebles, two very famous cosmologists, both of whom were at Princeton, and they collaborated on, you know, uh, a, a paper about conundrums and puzzles in cosmology. And so they point out these other two problems. One is called the flatness problem. And uh, Guth actually sat in the audience for a lecture that Dickey gave at Cornell, where Guth was also a postdoc prior to Stanford. And he heard about this problem and that sort of settled in the back of his mind. It's a good lesson that you can actually learn things by going to lectures. There you go. So what is the flatness problem? Um, think about the Friedman equation. H squared equals eight pi G over three rho minus K over A squared, okay. And I said, you know, if you have, if rho is constant, 
then the k over a squared term dilutes away and becomes unimportant. But for ordinary matter and radiation, so you know, think about what people were thinking of in 1977, all right? So they weren't thinking about scalar fields filling the universe. They were not thinking about the cosmological constant. They were thinking about particles and photons, matter and radiation. So for matter, so we can rewrite this as 8 pi g over 3. Um, rho matter it has some value when a equals 1, and then it goes like a to the minus 3. Okay, so I'm writing the energy density in matter, which is dependent on the scale factor, as a constant times a to the minus 3, because the number of particles just dilutes away as the scale factor gets bigger and the volume goes as a cubed. Radiation we talked about. Rho radiation starts at some fiducial value and then goes as a to the minus 4 because um, the energy density in radiation is the number density goes down as a cubed and then the energy per particle goes down as, as a because the wavelength gets stretched. So then minus k a to the minus 2. Okay, So this is what you would have been thinking of as a cosmologist in the mid-70s. You would think there's matter, there's radiation, there could be curvature, we don't know. And so there's no term in here that is constant. And so if you plot these puppies uh, as a function of the scale factor, rho i for matter radiation, and call this, call this term rho curvature, rho sub k. It's not an energy density, but it enters the Friedman equation in a way very similarly to an energy density. What you find is, of course, there's a to the minus 3, a to the minus 4, a to the minus 2. So a to the minus 4 goes down very quickly. That's radiation. Matter goes down somewhat more slowly. And curvature goes down the least slow at all. So it's the opposite story. The story that we told for inflation was if you have a constant energy density, curvature gets diluted away. If you don't have a constant energy density, if you have curvature, matter, and radiation, it's matter and radiation that get diluted away, and curvature always wins. Okay, so if you didn't know, if you didn't know what the initial curvature of the universe was, if you thought for whatever reason, and maybe this for whatever reason should be interrogated more carefully, but if you thought, you know, I don't know, there's some matter, there's some radiation, there's some curvature, just start at some random values and let them go. What you would predict, because the scale factor has increased by many orders of magnitude, what you would not maybe not predict but expect naturally is that the universe should be all curvature. It should be wildly curved. The curvature of space should be big, much bigger than the matter density or the radiation density in the Friedman equation. Okay, um, It's not, right? Even in the 70s, we knew the universe was not really, really curved. Euclidean geometry works pretty well on your tabletop, right? I mean, the amount of curvature we're talking here would be noticeable in your everyday life. Uh, and that's not true. So something went wrong there. So the in the conventional cosmology, um, the answer to this, is, well, the only way to answer this is to say you just start the universe with k really, 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 really small. So that even if it grows faster than matter and radiation, it still hasn't caught up to them today or only just started catching up to them today. That's the flatness problem. The flatness problem is our universe looks pretty flat. You would expect it to look really curved. Why was the curvature so small at early times? And then there is the, uh, the horizon problem. And the horizon problem comes from the fact that you know you just look at the universe with the cosmic microwave background. In the 1970s, they had they detected the cosmic microwave background in the 60s. They had not yet detected the temperature fluctuations from place to place. So as far as they knew, the microwave background looked perfectly smooth. Everyone knew it wasn't perfectly smooth, but the precision of the experiments to the day so it said that as far as they could tell, it looked smooth. And that's an issue because um, here's another space-time diagram. Here's time going up. Okay, and here we are right now. Here's us as observers. Okay, here's the past. Uh, let's say that this is the Big Bang. So this is well, this is space, and this is t equals zero, the Big Bang. And let's say here is the cosmic microwave background. Right, remember three hundred eighty thousand years after the Big Bang. And this is a space-time diagram, so. I should be consistent about the dashed lines. So we can draw light cones backward in time. And what you notice here is that even though space can be infinitely big, you're only looking at a certain part of space at any one time. 
okay? There's only a certain part of the universe that can possibly influence what happens to you. So an event, let's put this in colors, an event here, I'm trying to draw a star and, and failing, an event that happens there, I don't know what kind of event happened before recombination, but maybe it would. So the causal influence can certainly propagate upward in the universe and affect you. But uh, uh, something that happens out here, it just can't get to you, even if it moves at the speed of light. It is outside your light cone. Okay, so nothing that happens outside your light cone can possibly affect you. And the thing that is new about cosmology is that there's a beginning, right? In flat space and Minkowski space, uh, your light cones traced into the past just get bigger and bigger and bigger. You get more and more of the past of the universe could possibly influence you. But here in cosmology, they are cut off by the fact that the universe had a beginning. So if you look at the points where your vision, you're looking out at the universe and looking at the cosmic microwave background. So the points where your past light cone intersects the moment of recombination, the moment where the microwave background was formed in some sense when the universe became transparent, we can ask, well, what about the light cones of those points? So look at the sky, see the cosmic microwave background, ask what it would be like to be living at that point in the microwave, when the microwave background was formed, when the universe was becoming transparent, when the electrons were recombining with uh, protons and helium nuclei. Well, they have a horizon also. Well, they have a past light cone, okay? So you can call this distance here the horizon for this point right there. Whereas this whole thing is the horizon for us right there. So the horizon in this case is take your location in space time, trace your light cones back to the Big Bang. Okay, that defines a region of space at or very, 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 very close to the Big Bang. Call that your horizon. And what you see is if you call this point A and point B, right, two different points that you're looking at in the cosmic microwave background. The horizons of A and B, so this is horizon sub A, this is horizon sub B. They're non-overlapping. There's nothing in, literally nothing in the universe that affects what happens at point A and also affects what happens at point B. Their past light cones are non-overlapping. Again, in Minkowski space, in a non-expanding universe, you would just keep tracing those light cones back and eventually they would intersect each other. But here, that's not true. The Big Bang is the beginning. It's the boundary to space and time, okay? Under this theory, we haven't put in inflation yet. That was the idea. The horizon problem is a problem. Inflation is supposed to solve it. So the, the specific problem is, on the one hand, when you look at point A and B, these are two points in the cosmic microwave background, um, they're the same temperature, right? They are 2.7 degrees Kelvin, and that temperature is set by the initial conditions of that part of the universe. It's density, it's expansion rate, number of photons, number of electrons, all that stuff. That's true for both point A and point B. They have the same temperature, but in the conventional Big Bang model, they have non-overlapping pasts. Nothing was uh, causally influencing both of them. Now you could say that I have a theory of cosmology where you know uh, Stephen Hawking or God or the wave function of the universe sets up initial conditions at the universe, at the beginning of the universe, all over space instantaneously, okay? Because remember, it could be infinitely big. Um, well, you know, good for you. That's great. Good. Glad you have a theory like that. But we have no idea why that should be the case or whether that theory is true. So the horizon problem, the point of the horizon problem is that in the absence of a specific predictive theory of what was happening at the Big Bang, we have no reason, no understanding of why the temperature in two very distant regions of the cosmic microwave background should be the same. How do they know to be the same, even though they have no causal influence over each other? Um, and in fact, you can ask, you know, how far apart on the sky do you have to look to get two points which are causally disconnected in this way? And the answer is about one degree on the sky. So you can go 360 times around and get causally non-overlapping regions of the cosmic microwave sky.
That's the horizon problem, okay? And so inflation solves all of these. And I'm not going to go into detail. Well, sorry, inflation says it solves all of these. Um, we kind of already know how it solves the flatness problem because it dilutes away the curvature, right? If you start with a constant energy density, that energy density remains constant while the curvature goes away, k over a squared decreases while the energy density remains constant. And then at the end of inflation, what happens we're supposed to imagine is uh, there's sort of a drop off here at the end of inflation. And at that point, all the energy density in the inflaton converts into ordinary matter and radiation. It does not convert into curvature. The inflaton is a field made of stuff, and that stuff decays into other stuff that we know and love, okay? So you create big matter and radiation densities, you do not create big curvature, and that explains why the universe is flat. For the horizon problem, roughly speaking, what inflation does is say, well, actually, the universe had been expanding a lot longer than that. <laughs> and I say roughly speaking because it's not in time that it had been uh, expanding a lot longer than that, but it is, it is expanded by a lot more than that. So these light cones that you were tracing backward are, you know, deserve to be traced backward a lot more, and in fact, they do have an overlapping past. So, <laughs> and I hope no professional cosmologists are listening here, because I'm going to air the dirty laundry of cosmology. Um, both the horizon problem and the flatness problem are entirely BS, all right? I know that everyone loves them, and I, I used to think they were great, great in the sense that they were good motivations for inflation. You know, if you read my general relativity book, there they are, uh, presented with all the earnest sincerity that a good cosmologist can mu muster, but they're entirely bogus. There are problems, and there are problems that inflation addresses. They're just not these problems, okay? And the reason why, very, very briefly, is um, the flatness problem is is entirely bogus because, look, you said you started with this vague statement about, um, you know, maybe the matter density, the radiation density, the curvature, maybe they're all roughly equal to each other. And then what you need is that, in fact, the curvature is much, much, much smaller in order to be consistent with the data today. And then the implicit step is, how likely is that? It seems very, very unlikely that the curvature of the universe would be very, very small. Right. The thing is, we have a measure. Right? We talked about probability and, and measures a little bit. There is a measure defined by general relativity on the space of initial conditions. And in fact, in that measure, which maybe you don't want to use, but it's literally the only one that is predicted by the theory, in that measure, the universe is overwhelmingly likely to be flat. It is overwhelmingly likely to have an infinitesimally tiny curvature. In other words, if you pick a universe randomly out of a box, Probably that was not how our universe was made, but if you imagine doing something like that, you would not imagine getting equal amounts of matter, radiation, and curvature. You would imagine getting much more matter, radiation, than curvature. So the flatness problem isn't a problem at all. It's just the most natural thing in the world for the universe to be flat. The horizon problem is a little bit trickier because in, the horizon problem also has, has a step in it that is a bit of a cheat, okay? The horizon problem says, look, there are these two points uh, they're causally disconnected from each other. There was no reason uh, that there's no thing that ever happened in the history of the universe that set them to synchronize in some way. So why should they be at the same temperature? And then if you have inflation, then they do have uh, an overlapping causal past, so they can be set to the same temperature, right? You saw what happened there. I didn't say they are set to the same temperature. I just said they can be. And the point is that, again, I'm not saying that inflation doesn't solve problems. I'm just saying this isn't the way to say what the problems are. If you didn't have inflation, if you just for some reason let the universe expand very, very slowly for a long time, you could also expand these light cones so they would overlap in the past. But you wouldn't expect these different parts of the universe to equilibrate the universe should become lumpier. We talked about this when we were talking about entropy, right? The universe should grow under gravitational instability its differences in matter density from place to place. So we have an intuition from like an ordinary box of gas, where if you start a box of gas with cold on one side, hot on one side, they will even out, right? But that's not what happens in cosmology. They don't even out because the gravity is important, so they become even more lumpier. So there's a sleight of hand being pulled here in the horizon problem. Um, 
Of course, inflation is not like a box of gas either. So once you start inflation, then there is a reason why the two different regions of the universe become similar to each other and the reason why the cosmic microwave background is homogeneous. So inflation does what it purports to do. It makes the universe spatially flat, homogeneous, approximately the same everywhere. It predicts the kind of universe we actually live in. But this motivational pep talk about the horizon and flatness problem, much less the monopole problem, is a little bit off base. Um, the, just to drive that home a little bit, think about entropy, okay? We said that in the entropy video, we said that there is this issue of the past hypothesis, okay? Um, why is the entropy of the early universe so small? So. If you think about our universe today, so here's today, and think about some earlier time. Let's think about, um, I don't know, near the, think about near the CMB, near the recombination, okay? The universe was smaller. But the reason why that's a perfectly good place to think about is because there were no black holes or anything like that. I mean, the universe was pretty much smooth near the CMB. The, the variations in density from place to place were one part in 100,000, 10 to the minus five, very, very tiny. So this is a co-moving volume, okay? This is a region of space that is move, that is its definition of its boundaries is moving along with the matter in the universe. And the entropy, at this time, CMB, this means not the entropy of the CMB, but the entropy of our observable co-moving patch of universe at the time that the CMB was formed is about 10 to the 88th. We know that because it's a box of gas. It really is just a bunch of particles, and we know from the 1800s formulas for calculating the entropy of, of bunches of particles. Today, the entropy of the universe is much higher. Why? Because gravitational instability has had time to work. It's made black holes. Uh, I said that the black hole the center of our galaxy all by itself has an entropy of something like 10 to the 90th, bigger than the whole universe at the CMB time. So the entropy has gone up. Um, I forget actually what the number is today, but it's something like 10 to the 100 and, well, it's over 10 to the 100. Let's, let's put it that way. It's gone up by a lot, okay? Um, to the 103 maybe, I'm, I'm forgetting the number. I used to know this number off the top of my head, but anyway, it's gone up, that's what matters. And the point is, if you trace this, let's say this is what we know, and then you trace backwards, okay, into what we don't know. Well, if you just did the conventional Big Bang, right, so S, ordinary Big Bang, OBB, ordinary Big Bang, it's still about 10 to the 88th, right? And it's still just a box of gas with a bunch of particles in it. Maybe slightly fewer particles. Maybe it's 10 to the 87 or something like that. In fact, actually, it is smaller than that. Maybe 10 to the 86. There are fewer particles. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Entropy is only going to go up. But, um, okay, entropy went up, and there's still a long way for it to go. You know, the entropy that you could get if you took all the matter in our universe and put it in a black hole, as Roger Penrose has emphasized, is over 10 to the 120. So 10 to the 120 is much bigger than 10 to the 103, but 10 to the 103 is much bigger than 10 to the 86. So there's a huge problem. Why was the entropy of the early universe so small? And inflation is supposed to be a theory that tells you, that makes the initial conditions of the universe natural. But inflation says, well, the reason why the entropy of the universe was small then is because it started with a little inflationary patch with an entropy of order 10 or something like that, you know, one or 10 to the 10 to the three or something like that, some incredibly tiny number. That's what you need to have this little, remember we talked about what happens when you start inflation, you have a scalar field and it has energy density, which is its time derivative and its potential. You notice we did not have a spatial derivative, d phi dx. Okay, where x is a little vector. There was no energy from the variations in the field from place to place in space. That was an assumption that there wasn't any. Why? Well, because if there were, inflation wouldn't start. That energy density would dilute away very, very quickly, and you do not have this constant push to the expansion of the universe. So you assume that there isn't that much, as we say, gradient energy at early times. That assumption I'm skipping some steps, but that assumption is equivalent to saying that the entropy of the early universe was super duper small. 
So inflation explains the low entropy of the early universe by saying that there was an even lower entropy at earlier times, which is obviously cheating. That is not okay, right? Um, this is why I am personally ambivalent about inflation. On the one hand, it's good. It solves a lot. It explains, let's put it this way. Forget about words like solves and explains. It predicts that the universe should look like the universe we see. That's why inflation is good. That's one reason. The other reason is to start inflation, it needs to be very, this is a very small amount of space. You know, the in ordinary Big Bang, you know, the early universe that it corresponds to our observable universe today was, I forget, but it's, you know, millimeters or micrometers, something like that, which is a small size compared to the universe today, but enormously big compared to particle physics scales. Whereas in inflation, the universe could start as small as the Planck scale and then expand. So inflation provides in principle a bridge from a true theory of quantum gravity that explains what the universe was doing when it's at the Planck scale to the observable universe with the microwave background and all that stuff. And via that bridge, it predicts that the universe should look like the universe we see. That's why I think it's an attractive theory. But I just don't think it actually solves any of the puzzles that it was purported to solve, either because it doesn't or because those puzzles are uh, not really puzzles, right? The real puzzle is the entropy puzzle, and it totally boots that one. It totally just assumes that the entropy of the universe was small. What can I say? All right, that's my little rant about inflation for today. Let's see. We have some other questions. Uh, those, are, those are the major ones I wanted to get to, but we have some other fun ones. Uh, one was, why does, the, why does general relativity predict that the universe is either expanding or contracting? Remember, that's what got Einstein uh, hot and bothered when he realized, oh, no, my theory is incompatible with the data. So remember the Friedman equation. I'm going to write it again so I don't have to keep referring back. 8 pi g over 3 rho minus k over a squared. So we're putting the curvature in. Um, well, look, the prediction that the universe is either expanding or contracting is just a prediction that h is not equal to 0, right? If you don't have the curvature term, so let's say that you just erase this, right? If there's no curvature, if you're in a flat universe, then clearly the universe has to be expanding or contracting. H is a non-zero number. So H, because it's H squared, H could be positive or negative, right? So it could either be expanding or contracting, but it's definitely not zero if you don't have the cosmological constant, because he didn't invent it yet in 1917. So you could put back in the curvature term. Right? And then you could say, okay, why don't I balance it? Why don't I say that k is greater than zero? That's squared, sorry. k is greater than zero. Um, rho is some number, and they exactly cancel. Maybe that's what it is. But then you have to say, okay, that's perfectly okay. But then you have to look at the next. There's another equation that we weren't looking at before. Okay? The point is, h is 1 over, oops, let's write it as a dot over a. So that depends on the first derivative of a. But there is another equation for the second derivative of a. And what you find if you plug in, I'm not showing you what that equation is, it's a mess, but if you set the universe to be exactly h equals 0 by balancing rho and k, the second derivative of the scale factor with time is not 0. So if you truly have a universe that is not expanding, so if you think that what you're getting is, as a function of time, here's the scale factor. If you think you're getting this, okay, um, that's not compatible because that would be a solution where the scale factor has zero first derivative, zero second derivative, zero third derivative. It's literally not changing. Instead, what Einstein's equation by the Friedman equation predicts is you are at the peak of a universe that is expanding and then contracting again. Okay? So that's what you would actually live in. So there's no universe in general relativity with the, with the ingredients of curvature, matter, and radiation, no cosmological constant, that could just be constant and stay constant. That's not an allowed solution. Um, so that's why Einstein had to invent the cosmological constant. Once he gets... Uh, so once he gets a universe where there is a cosmological constant, then you can balance everything out. Again, I'm not going to go into the details, but that becomes possible. But that's where the prediction comes from. Uh, which is related to the question of, you know, is there a relationship between the fate of the universe and the geometry of the universe? There is, but kind of. It becomes messy. Uh, and this is probably less important for me to explain now than it would have been 
20 years ago, but when I was your age, uh, we were taught that there was an ironclad relationship between the geometry of space, positively curved, flat, or negatively curved, and the future of the universe. Because if you have h squared equals 8 pi g over 3, it's getting sloppy here, over 3 minus k over a squared, if that's your equation, oops, rho, sorry, and there's no cosmological constant, lambda equals 0, then you can actually show, it's pretty easy to show, that as time goes on and the scale factor goes on, there's two possibilities. Um, well, let's put it this way. There is, here's what would happen if the universe, let's just say that rho is matter, okay? Rho matter is proportional to a to the minus three. You can put in radiation, but it doesn't really matter, as long as we don't put in the cosmological constant. So here is the universe where k equals zero, then a is proportional to t to the two-thirds. This is my attempt to draw t to the two-thirds. If k is a negative number, then the universe will expand forever also. So t to the two-thirds expands forever. k is less than zero. The universe also expands forever. And whenever k is greater than zero, look at what happens. If k is greater than zero, uh, the matter dilutes away as the universe expands. The curvature dilutes away also, but more slowly, right? So if the curvature is small initially, the matter is what is matter, what matters, as it were, in the universe, um, that's good, but eventually it will catch up. So eventually this k over a squared term, which is negative for k uh, equal greater, greater than zero, this k over a squared term will exactly balance the matter term, eventually, if you wait long enough. So positively curved universes look like this, k greater than zero. And so there is a relationship. Positively curved universes are finite in time. Negatively curved universes can last forever. Okay. Um, sadly, so that was a very nice thing, because when people thought they were measuring the spatial geometry of the universe, they said we're measuring the future of the universe. We're going to tell you whether it expands forever or not. Um, once they realized in 1980, 1998 that the cosmological constant was greater than zero, they had to rewrite all of those statements because, I mean, they should have known all along and the best ones did know all along, but the cosmological constant changes this uh, set of predictions. Then if you, a better way to plot it, let me see if I can actually do this correctly. Um, the parameter space which we might want to draw is, uh, well, I need to tell you what omega is, don't I? Well, okay, I will. Here is omega matter. Here is omega lambda. So omega is the density parameter of the universe. And we're imagining, once again, a universe that is just matter and uh, cosmological constant now. No radiation. Doesn't change anything qualitatively. Omega i is 8 pi g over 3 rho over h squared. So we take the Friedman equation, and we divide both sides by h squared, okay? So we get something that is normalized in some nice way. And so h, so in other words, this, with this definition, um, we get 1 equals omega minus k over a squared h squared, okay? So you see that instantly you can get k equals a squared h squared times, uh, let me get it right, omega minus 1. So there's instantly a relationship between the, dens the density curvature parameter, density parameter, density parameter, and the curvature. Namely, if omega is greater than 1, then k is a positive number. If omega is less than 1, then k is, an, is a negative number. So omega, even though it's a measure of density, if you believe the Friedman equation, instantly tells you the curvature of space. That's why it's called, that's why it's a useful way of parameterizing the um, density. And so if you have matter and the cosmological constant, what we, what we care about, what you thought you cared about is, is omega total greater than one, right? That tells you the spatial curvature. So here's a line, omega total equals omega matter plus omega lambda uh, equals one, right? So here, for omega greater than one, 
k is greater than zero this way k is less than zero on the line k equals zero so the way to think about this is the the new thing that enters with the cosmological constant is go back to the k greater than zero case with no cosmological constant okay if you think about these two terms that are on the right hand side of the friedman equation what's going on the matter is always expanding the universe, right? I mean, the way to think about this in terms of Einstein's equation is um, energy density sources the curvature of space-time and the expansion of space-time. The expansion of space is one version of the curvature of space-time, one way in which space-time can be curved. The spatial curvature is another way. It sort of divides up that way in cosmology. So rho is positive, therefore h squared kind of wants to be positive, right? But if k is greater than zero, k over a squared goes away more slowly than k over than something over a cubed, like the matter density does. So as the universe expands, this term will always start to dominate, and this term wants to cancel off the push that the energy density of the universe is getting from, that the expansion rate of the universe is getting from matter. So eventually these two terms will be of the same size, and they will say h equals zero, and that traces out this path. That's the zero point, and then it will recollapse. Okay, so the basic mechanism is that k over a squared, the curvature, always goes away more slowly than the matter. But when you have a cosmological constant, the cosmological constant, if it's positive, wants to make the universe expand. Positive energy density, and I know this is a little bit counterintuitive. Positive matter, let me, let's put it this way. Matter, like galaxies, dark matter, slows the expansion of the universe down, but at the same time makes sure the universe is still expanding, right? So that's why we talk about the deceleration of the universe if we didn't know about the cosmological constant. The universe would expand, but ever more slowly. And you see that in the A goes as T to the two cube, two thirds uh, curve. So there's these two effects going on, okay? Rho slows down the expansion of the universe because galaxies pull on each other, but also it can't be zero if it's just matter because h squared is proportional to rho. As long as there is energy density and we don't have a curvature or a negative energy density, the universe has to expand. A negative cosmological constant, okay, uh, can make the universe recollapse. A positive cosmological constant, though, wants to push it. So matter goes away faster than the curvature. So if matter is positive and curvature is negative, they can cancel. But if you have a positive cosmological constant, that goes away even more slowly than matter do than curvature does, because it doesn't go away at all. Positive cosmological constant will always win at the end of the day. And so in this little diagram here, what you get is, let's get a different color, for k less than zero, I should, I should have said this more explicitly before, it's, it's easy to know what happens when k is less than zero. Without the cosmological constant, the universe wants to expand forever. If there's a negative cosmological constant, that will always eventually win because it doesn't dilute away. So the universe expands and expands, gets rid of all the matter, all the curvature, and all you have is a negative cosmological constant which forces the universe to recollapse. So we can draw the dividing line like this. So this is, uh, I can just draw, keep drawing it this way. So these are universes that expand forever. And these are universes that recollapse. Okay, so for on this line where omega lambda equals zero, then it's just is omega matter greater than or equal to one. Um, when omega lambda is not zero, when there's any cosmological constant, a negative cosmological constant always makes the universe recollapse. What about when omega matter is greater than one? That means that without the cosmological constant, the universe would be positively curved and would recollapse, okay? Well, if it's just right, if there's a little window in there, the universe gets big, big enough that the, you might think it's gonna recollapse, but the cosmological constant becomes important. So if there's a positive cosmological constant, a positive cosmological constant wants the universe to expand forever. The only way to stop that from happening is if the matter is big enough that it causes the universe to recollapse before the cosmological constant can take over. So in this plot, you see there's a region that kind of looks like this, okay? So in this little wedge down there, even though there's a positive cosmological constant, uh, you don't have enough time for it to matter. The universe recollapses. So this is still the recollapsing. 
and this is still the expand forever. So, but notice that he, this, to the top side of the diagonal line, let's, let's make the diagonal line a different color so it kind of stands out. Here's the diagonal line. This is the spatial curvature line, right? So these are negatively curved universes below the line, and some of them recollapse, but they will expand forever if they have a positive cosmological constant. Sorry, that's obvious. When curvature is negative, they want to expand forever. They will still do that if the cosmological constant is positive, but if the cosmological constant is negative, even a negatively curved universe will recollapse. Whereas if the curvature is positive, it depends on the details of exactly the relative amount of cosmological constant to matter. So the point is, the very long-winded way, once again, of saying that things become complicated once you allow there to be both matter and cosmological constant. The simple relationship between the fate of the universe and its geometry, its spatial geometry, is no longer there. Okay. Um, yes, I want to talk about energy conservation because people did mention this, and this is a, a thing. Uh, I mentioned it, but let me mention, say, say one more thing about it. Huh, entropy. I always think about ent entropy. Energy conservation. Remember I said that if you have a box of universe, here's space, but I'm sort of making it look three-dimensional now. It's going to expand as before. I'm going to move this whole thing down to give me more room. So it expands. You have more space. So if the universe has nothing in it but matter particles, slowly moving particles, then in that expanding region, the energy density goes to the number of particles, that remains constant, the energy remains constant. But so rho, let me put it this way. Um, let's define the energy in the box. Let me move this box a little bit here. There's something I can define, which maybe might not be a good thing to define if you're a professional cosmologist, but it, it gets intuitively to what's going on here. I will define the energy inside the box as the integral over the volume of the box of rho, the energy density, right? So I just add up inside the box the energy density. And then as the universe expands, uh, for matter, E box equals constant. For radiation, the number of radiation particles remains the same, but the energy per particle goes down. So E box decreases. And for uh, vacuum energy, the energy per cubic centimeter remains the same. The total number of cubic centimeters goes up. So E box increases. And the question is, um, is there some way that we can describe this as the energy going into the gravitational field, right? Can we, can we somehow rescue conservation of energy by saying that really what we're doing here is talking about the energy and matter and radiation uh, and vacuum, but there's also the energy of the gravitational field? And the answer there is, you know, not really, honestly, like I wish there were, but it's not quite like that. If you follow the structure of the equations of general relativity, there is no natural way to associate uh, with anything that appears in those equations the energy of a box, including the gravitational field and everything else, so that it remains constant. But I think that's okay. Like, I don't think it should bother you. People have tried, and, you know, in other circumstances, it kind of works, right? Like, you can sort of fudge your way into it. But I think there's a different way of thinking about it. The way of thinking about it is there's still an equation, right? The equation used to be the equation of energy conservation in non-expanding universes just says DE dt equals zero, right? Where it, you know, it doesn't change over time, the energy of a closed system. So this was before GR came along, but now we have an expanding universe. And it's not that the equation just disappears. It goes to dE dt is some function of the kinds of matter we have and what space-time is doing. 
how the universe is expanding. So general relativity predicts a very specific equation for how these things change. And you, you know that, right? As the universe expands, the vacuum energy is proportional to the volume. The radiation density goes down as the scale factor goes up. It's exactly like that. It's not like all craziness is broken loose. There's something very, very definite that happens. So this is my particular way of doing it. You know, the reason why this is worth saying, even though it's kind of a fuzzy conclusion because different cosmologists like to use different words for this, um, is that it's a lesson that different cosmologists like to use different words for this. The words aren't what matter, right? All the cosmologists who will slightly disagree about is energy conserved or not in an expanding universe, they all agree on the equations. They have zero disagreement about physically what is happening. The only disagreement is to, as to what is most convenient to attach to equations and words, which what is the most convenient way to attach words to the equations, okay? That is something that people can disagree about. And the lesson that I'm trying to get across is that's fine. Like, who cares about that? You know, I don't even say that people who disagree with me about this particular vocabulary are wrong. I just say they're just using different vocabulary words to express what is going on. Okay, so that's a good lesson to end on here. I think that, uh, you know, there's many th more things to say. There were a lot of good questions, a lot of good things to talk about. Oh, wait, yeah, no, there's one, one thing I just got to talk about. Sorry, you were hopeful that we were going to end, but there's one more thing to talk about. Uh, is Brooklyn expanding? This, of course, is uh, a uh, illusion reference to a scene in Annie Hall, the Woody, Hall, Woody Allen movie, where young uh, Woody Allen is at the therapist's office and he's uh, full, of, full of anxiety because the universe is expanding. And his mother tells you, what do you care? The universe is expanding. Brooklyn is not expanding. But people wonder about that. They say, they say wait a minute. Um, the universe is expanding, but pretty slowly, right? You know, the universe, the expansion of the universe is not a speed. It's not a velocity. Any one galaxy has a velocity, but Hubble's constant is velocity equals distance times the Hubble constant. So for different distances, galaxies move at different velocities. The best way to think about the Hubble constant is as a rate. Uh, you can think about, you know, the Hubble constant h in the real world, there's a controversy over what the value of h is today, h naught. But roughly speaking, it's approximately 70 uh, in units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, these are silly units. Remember when we talked about units uh, earlier. What this means is, of course, we have velocity equals Hubble constant times distance. So this is measured in kilometers per second. Distance is measured in megaparsecs. So the Hubble constant converts from distance to velocity. And that's why it's in these weird units. But these units are distance divided by time divided by distance. So this has units of one over time. It does not have units of velocity. That's crucially important. So these are convenient units to use, but the actual physical thing going on is one over time. Because the Hubble constant is basically saying, how much time does it take for the universe to double in size? Okay. Uh, so we talk about the Hubble time, th, uh, which is just one over the Hubble constant. I am setting all uh, c equal 1, things like that. But I think in this case, c, the speed of light, doesn't even appear. And this is about, you know, 10 billion years, right? 10 to the 10 years, roughly speaking. So what this is saying is it takes almost 10 billion years for the universe to double in size. And so uh, in one year or 10 years, the universe doesn't expand by very much. So you might very well ask, uh, is it possible that Brooklyn is expanding, or at least the solar system? I mean, Brooklyn is held together by the structural forces of the Earth, right, and you know the ground and the, the buildings and so forth. But less poetically, is the solar system expanding? Because planets are not bound by material objects to the sun, right? Or is the Earth slowly moving away from the sun because of the expansion of the universe, and we just haven't noticed because the expansion of the universe is so small? So the answer is no. That's the answer. The answer is not it's expanding very slowly. It's not expanding at all. Or rather, um, it may be doing all sorts of weird things. You know, the solar system is buffeted 
by the gravitational fields of other stars and gravitational waves passing through. So there's always slight deviations in the distances between the planets and the sun, but it is not overall either expanding or contracting at all, okay? Um, it is hard for me to explain that. I have two ways of explaining it, neither one of which have historically been very effective, but I'll give them both of you. The first one is just in words. Um, you can think of here, not just in words, I'll draw a picture. So here's time, once again, space, okay? And this is the expansion of the universe, but rather than drawing the parallelogram to be all space, let me draw some particles, okay? And as the universe expands, the particles move further apart from each other. This is what it means to be an expanding universe, right? Not the prettiest diagram ever, but there you go. And you can think of this as sort of just inertial motion given some initial conditions, okay? Uh, it is almost kind of halfway analogous to take a baseball and throw it into the sky. Throw it very, very fast. You know that if you throw an object away from the Earth uh, for realistic amounts of velocity that you can give the baseball, it will come back after a while, it'll go up and then come down. But if there is a escape velocity where if you throw it fast enough, the thing will just take off into outer space and never come back, okay? So you can think of the expansion of the universe as kind of like that. This picture that I drew here corresponds to a perfectly uniform initial condition, which we think is, is true, but, um, but sorry, is almost true, but it's not perfect, right? There are deviations. There are slightly over-dense and under-dense regions. So if you have some set of particles more nearby that are in an over-dense region, they will pull together and they will sort of initially be expanding apart, but then they will start collapsing together. And we call this the formation of a galaxy or something like that, right? A galaxy or a star or whatever. And so the first explanation as to why Brooklyn is not expanding or the solar system is not expanding is that these bound structures have departed. Is departed the right word? Um, yeah, okay. They have, well, departed is not the right word. They have left the decoupled from the expansion of the universe. What is affecting their dynamics is their local interactions, not the expansion of the universe. And people don't like that. They say, well, look, if I have, you know, if they go back to the analogy, right, like the rubber sheet is being pulled apart or the balloon is being blown up. If you, if you take a, a small balloon and you put dots on it with a magic marker and then you blow it up, it's not only that the dots get further apart, the dots get bigger, right? And so they say, like, maybe there is a tiny effect. Or if the rubber sheet, if I have, you know, if I draw pictures on the rubber sheet and I pull it apart, then everything gets bigger. That's just not a good analogy. The analogy has broken down in that case. Uh, it's much better if you think of the rubber sheet and you put pennies on the rubber sheet or coins on the rubber sheet and you pull them apart, right? The coins get further apart as you pull the rubber sheet, but they don't get bigger. They might have an infinitesimally incredibly tiny force exerted on them by the sheet below them, uh, but then there's a restoring force from the tension inside the coin, so they don't get bigger at all. Um, the raisins in the raisin bread, if you put them in uh, the oven, another famous analogy for the expanding universe is raisin bread you put in the oven, let it expand. The raisins don't expand along with the bread because they're held together by the forces inside the raisin. It's even more true here for the universe because um, there's just as many things pulling it together or more things pulling it together than pulling it apart. So that's one explanation. The other explanation is um, I can give you an exact solution to Einstein's equation that is not exactly the real world, but might be that resembles the real world in, a, in an evocative way. So let me draw not space time, but just space. So here is space, okay? And I imagine that I fill space with stuff, dense matter, right? So if I do this correctly, it will be exactly the same shade of gray everywhere, representing the fact that the matter is perfectly smooth. There we go, okay? And so in this case, this represents a universe where 
it's exactly homogeneous everywhere, exactly uniform, and it would expand and continue to be exactly uniform. So that is a solution to Einstein's equations for cosmology. But now, let me take this and duplicate it. Let me give you another solution to Einstein's equation. Um, I can take a circular region. Let me take it this way. I can take a circular region in this universe. And I don't eliminate all the matter in it, but I take all the matter that was in that region and I move it to the center. Okay, so I put it all right in the middle. And I can do that at various points. So I can do that over here, and it doesn't even matter the size. I can do a bigger region. Oops, I can't make it lumpy. It needs to be perfectly spherical. That's the rule of the game. If it's perfectly spherical, then all the matter went there. So you're imagining that the matter collapsed to that central point, okay? And I don't disturb the particles that are still left in between. But I can do this, I can make this hole called a vacuole, and I can make a hole in the universe and contract all of the matter to the center. And as the universe expands, it turns out this, as long as the amount of matter that I put at the center of that region is the same that was in there before I evacuated it, this is still an exact solution to Einstein's equation. So in other words, if I'm living here at some point in the uniform distribution of matter, I don't notice that I've changed from this picture to that picture. The dynamics near me, oops, is exactly the same. What even happened there? Okay. So what that means is the, the size of the region expands along with the universe. And the life within this region, so if we live here, our little galaxy, the metric of space-time in that region has zero expansion. It is the Schwarzschild metric locally. It is the metric of a single blob of matter with a spherically symmetric vacuum around it. There is exactly zero uh, influence of the fact that it's surrounded by an expanding universe. So this is not a completely realistic version of the universe we live in, but it is a, an analogy, uh, a close relative of it, to drive home the fact that we can have an exact solution to Einstein's equation in which the universe as a whole is expanding, and in local regions where things have become overdense and collapsed, there is precisely zero expansion. It's not that there's just a little bit. And we can solve the equations exactly, and we can show that. So the analogies that we use for the expansion of the universe are helpful in some ways and not helpful in other ways. And this is a way in which uh, the, the, the balloon and the raisin bread and all these things are slightly less than perfect. Brooklyn's not expanding, the solar system's not expanding, nothing like that. The universe is expanding, though. All right, and this is, you know, like I said, there are many more questions that I could have answered. Uh, the cosmology, it's a big field. There's a lot going on. I encourage you to, you know, hit up the internet and uh, look for more information because you'll never stop learning more about how cool the universe is.